All right. So yeah. So let's uh, let's tell some stories. Um, so let's see. This um, this is a short talk. Uh, it's about AI, but um, actually, it's about ghosts. Uh, I'm going to tell you three ghost stories today each, and every ghost in the world is born out of tragedy and disaster. I'm going to tell you about the first one. Uh, what you see before you. That's Henrietta Lacks growing up, sort of. Um, this is her human form. She was born in 1920, log cabin in Virginia, cancer at 31 years old. She passes away and she lives on through her five children. They carry on her soul and her memories and her DNA. The rest of us, we just get the DNA. Um, that's what you see here. Um, Henrietta is buried in an unmarked grave. We don't even know where her body is, but her DNA is everywhere. This is her in 2024. These are cells that were crafted from her, named after her, HALA cells. Um, these cells are just replicating endlessly into the future. They're used for biomedical research, AIDS, polio vaccines, that kind of thing. And the cells are really unusual. My cells, your cells, generally speaking, have 23 pairs of chromosomes. These cells have between 35 and 40. They don't die out like yours and mine do. They're immortal, effectively. So this kind of replication is a thing that cells do, cancer cells anyway, and that's also what ghosts do. Right? They live forever, unaware that they're dead. This, this is the economist Thomas Herndon still among us. Not a ghost, he's a ghost hunter. He was a grad student years ago, and he was puzzling over the data in this specific economic paper. The paper is by these two super esteemed Harvard economists, Reinhardt and Rogoff. They're seen here in their human form. Um, and they are so esteemed that the journals that they published in don't even have peer review, because what do you need that for? Here's the paper that they published in 2010, Growth in a Time of Debt. Uh, on the right, uh, that's the data it was drawn from. The data wasn't included in the paper, just the conclusions, which were broadly that when public debt exceeds 90% of GDP, growth collapses. So what did that mean in 2010 when it was published? It meant austerity for everybody. I mean, not you probably, but everybody else. Right? <laughs> for the folks that read the paper or anybody who listened to anybody who read the paper, like Paul Ryan, David Cameron, they both used that paper, those conclusions, to support cutting health care and retirement and education and transportation and other luxuries. And if you look at it, some of austerity's roots, of the many roots, some of them very directly trace back to this paper from 2010, because Harvard data is the best data. Um, so our non-Harvard ghost hunter friend, Thomas Herndon, grad student at the time, he gains access to the actual spreadsheets that are used to draw those conclusions. And the problem that he finds, just sitting there doing the math, is that the data, in a literal sense, just doesn't add up. Um, Reinhardt and Rogoff didn't include the last five rows of data. Denmark, Canada, Belgium, Austria, Australia. Who among us, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a spreadsheet error, basically, that costs us the frameworks for healthcare, culture, public services. Um, it's just bad data that, just like Hella cells, just replicates into an austere eternity. Like cells, that's what data does. It just replicates, it expands, and then it shapes the world that we live in. And these kind of erratic Canadian ghosts all up in your domestic policy. Um, <laughs> before Thomas Herndon, nobody even knew that they were there or how they would haunt us. And we wouldn't even know about it, except that Herndon really went deep on a paper. And that's actually what brings me here today, the story that I told Jeff back in New York, because of a paper that I read. Um, this is the paper. It's a paper called Bloomberg GPT, a large language model for finance, published about 10 months ago. Um, Bloomberg announced that they rolled out their own GPT. And unlike, I don't know, uh, open AI, they're open about it, right? They're sort of like very straightforward. <laughs> this, is, this is what we did. This is how we built it. Um, and that's worth a lot these days, and I give them a lot of props for that. Um, and not only did they publish how it was constructed broadly, they also published how it was evaluated. And they did this in a super responsible way. They used what's called the big bench evaluation. It helps identify the strengths and weaknesses of an AI once you've built it, of a model. Um, there's a really specific test. I would love to tell you about all of them. The penguins in a table is 
very funny, actually. But um, today, we're just going to focus on the web of lies test. The web of lies test is when you present an AI with a series of statements where the, the truth of some statements is dependent on the truth of other statements, how can a model figure out what's real and what's true? And it turns out that the Bloomberg GPT model is really good at that. Um, and it's not that much of a surprise, right? Because Bloomberg has access to some of the best data on the planet, like Harvard grade data. You know? And <laughs> the, the CTO of Bloomberg said it, and I agree with this, right? That the quality of machine learning models comes down to the data you put into them. So, what data is that? Well, like all GPTs, it's trained on a combination of public data and private data. The private data is really essential, and Bloomberg has a lot of that because it's Bloomberg. But the public data is actually a much larger corpus. And you can see that it's things like all the subtitles on YouTube and all the code on GitHub. But then there, in the last five rows, you can see it just above Wikipedia, um, uh, Enron emails. <laughs> of, of course, Enron emails, right? And I, I happen to know a lot about these emails, but that's because I read papers, not because I stan Enron, which, just to refresh your memory, was the seventh largest company in the United States, uh, collapses in 2001 because of some of the most reckless financial fraud in the United States history, which is ambitious, right? And it leaves behind, <laughs> it leaves behind this, like, smoking crater of, in 2024 terms, $185 billion, leaves California without electricity, leaves pension funds, without pensions, leads to federal investigations and ultimately convictions. Um, this is back in 2001, by the way, back when reckless fraud could still send you to prison. <laughs> and so, so Kenneth Lay... <laughs> Kenneth, <laughs> Kenneth Lay and, Je and Jeffrey Skilling go to prison. Dick Cheney retires, kind of. And then Arthur Anderson rebrands uh, somehow. This is Accenture now. Um, because... Arthur, because Arthur Anderson in particular, the auditing accountants shredded all the documents, right? And so prosecutors had to get really inventive about how to piece together the criminal conspiracy of Enron. So they found all the Enron emails backed up on a single Oracle server. So the Fed swooped in and they got them. All of them, right? All the Enron emails, 500,000 of them, right? And if you poke at them, you can actually see fraud, not just in the words that they use, but in the actual dynamics of their interaction. Look, if you, like this here, that's a healthy company on the left, right? That's like a lot of people talking to a lot of people about a bunch of things, whatever it is. And then this thing over on the right, the thing that looks like weirdly like a COVID spike protein, like I, like, I don't know what. That's, that's Enron. That's what fraud looks like. Like, fraud has a shape. It's just, it's a, a bunch of people talking to a bunch of people, and then a few people who don't really talk to that many people at all. That's the shape of fraud. Because when you're doing crimes over email, you don't reply all. And even, uh, <laughs> even, even Enron, even Enron knew that. So, how does all this end up in Bloomberg's hands? How does it end up in their GPT? So, in 2003, when the government enters all these into evidence and it leads to a conviction, all the Enron emails are released to the people of the United States. And right away, this is like 20 years ago, a researcher said, oh, this is awesome. It's like free data that we can use to train an AI. And props to Bloomberg for publishing that, right? They, they didn't have to let us know that they did that. And most everybody else won't, which is part of what's interesting to me about all this, right? Because think about it, right? Like the only reason that you know what's in your Fruit Loops is because 120 years ago, Upton Sinclair wrote a book about what's in your sausage, which I have obscured here for your comfort. Um, and and even, even America was persuaded back in the 20th century that maybe it's better if you know what's in your food. So, again, props to Bloomberg for being good enough to publish these ingredients and to let us know that a large language model for finance learned how to speak from, at least in some part, a financial model for criminal conspiracy to tell us what things mean. Because that's what fraud does, right? It just replicates endlessly into the future. This is Enron, unaware that it's dead. This is the future that we live in, lousy with ghosts of cancer patients and economists and criminals. You can't see them or smell them but they shape what we're told, whether it's by doctors or politicians, but now also by AI, which scales way quicker than Paul Ryan in his dreams, 
right? These are the disasters of scale. Right? Every one of these ghosts was a person. Every one of them shapes the landscapes of our decisions, and some of those ghosts were in the top 10 financial criminals of our time. So the next time an AI speaks, if you listen carefully, maybe you can hear them. Thanks. Thanks.